Good morning. You're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. each Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. Today, I'm speaking with Andrea Romero, the Mexico State Rep for District 46. And we'll get to Andrea in just a minute after a few short announcements. Before we get started, I always like to acknowledge that we are conducting this interview on stolen Tewa land and thank our Tewa na- neighbors for being such good stewards of the land. We better start learning from them and learning fast. I also want to remind you that as part of our series on New Mexico Democratic House members, last week I spoke with Susan Herrera, House Rep for District 41. And next week I'll be speaking with Cristina Ortez to complete the five-week series that brought us Rina Sapansky, Roger Montoya, Susan Herrera, and now with Andrea Romero today and Christina next week, that will complete the series. I want to remind you that if you're driving around and miss any of today's show, you can watch the full YouTube recording of this show and any prior interview, including any of the interviews with legislators, by going to retakeourdemocracy.org and clicking on the Retake on the Radio button on the right side of the homepage. You'll find YouTube recordings for all of our previous shows. With the 2022 session over, except for a very quick special session to be held, well, actually it will have been held by the time we have this interview because we're recording it early. Um, Retake this in any case is shifting its focus to the primary election. As part of that work, we are identifying races where either solid Democrats are being challenged by moderate or conservative Dems or where an incumbent Dem is being challenged by a more progressive one. We will be announcing the list of races on which we are focusing very soon. As part of our election work, we just held a candidate forum with Democratic candidates for the New Mexico State Auditor. It was a stirring discussion with candidates not seeing the questions before the forum, so the answers couldn't be carefully crafted ahead of time. So you got a more unvarnished view of both Joe Maestas and Zach Quintero. You can view that debate by going to retakeourdemocracy.org and clicking on the action and events pit in the menu bar. The recording is near the top of that page. Retake is also getting ready for the interim hearings, which will begin soon. Retake is working with allies to support to allies to support their interim hearing strategies and conducting supportive research and, and initiating dialogue with key legislators on key issues that Retake will be focused upon in 2022-23. Stay tuned as there will be actions you can take in both the primaries and the interim hearings. If you wanna keep current on on the interim hearings and on election actions, you should go to our uh, Retake page and go to actions and events and you'll see our huddles. We do huddles every, the second Wednesday of every month from six to 7.30. And that's where we discuss our strategy. And it's really forming a kind of retake our community, retake community. I think Andrea's been on a couple of them. So that's one way to keep informed. Um, we'll also be initiating a range of proactive strategies to prepare for the 2023 legislative session. This work will include working closely with key allies and legislators to cultivate interest, understanding, and support for bills we support. Retake will be most active engaging and educating key legislators on the, the issues that we plan to introduce in 2022-23, introduce or support. So that's about, it. oh, our next huddle will be actually this one, coming Wednesday, April 13th, from 6 to 7.30. You must register to uh, participate in the huddle by going to retakeourdemocracy.org and clicking on the actions and events menu bar and a page will open up and uh, information about the huddle is near the top. That's more than enough uh, announcements, a little bit repetitive, I apologize for that. Um, Welcome, Andrea. Thanks for making time for the conversation. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. I love talking to you about all things New Mexico. Okay, well, let's start. I always like to let our guests introduce themselves. So how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in policy and politics in general and how that led you to serving as the rep for District 46? I love this question. I never really, uh, it was interesting for me to even think about when this may have started on my life's journey. And it goes back, I think for me as a student at Santa Fe High, um, when 9-11 happened, 
Um, I had never thought about the rest of the world and how it affected me and what who was making decisions. And from that sort of moment, it led me to really getting involved even locally um, in what was going on in politics. Um, I think the first election that I ever participated in was with John Kerry. Um, I was, you know, adamantly opposed to the war in Iraq. And um, I think I had a photo on the front page of the New Mexican with him as a 16 year old make love not war t-shirt, um, you know, in my t-shirt. And then uh, moving on to, you know, knocking doors for Obama um, and turn, I, I went and knocked doors in Nevada um, right after the recession where every other home in, in that we were knocking on was in foreclosure, it was terrifying to see all of that. So having all of these sort of different uh, adventures in politics early on as a student, um, and then moving my life to Mozambique, Africa, getting involved in um, the you know food policy work that I was doing then sort of helped me understand what I wanted to participate in in democracy was trying to figure out how to do the basics well. And that may, allowed me to come back home and think about all of the different ways I could participate, started volunteering and was on boards and um, just a bunch of sort of groundwork. And in 2016, when Trump got elected, I was super worried about holding the line in my own neighborhood, in my own backyard, and started looking at who does represent me. I hadn't really participated in, in all of that other than supporting different candidates. And, um, when I realized that in our state legislature, the incumbent at the time didn't really reflect our democratic progressive values, I felt very called to, to try to see that after asking a million people to run <laughs> other than myself, um, who, could, who could run um, and perhaps be more reflective of those values. And um, at the time that I was asking everyone who would run for this seat, um, uh, folks were saying, how about you? And so that was really me stepping up at that point um, in my value and in that space to, to, to be able to try to contribute in this way. And now I'm looking and, and seeking a third term to continue the work that we've been building upon in our legislature, which makes so many important decisions. And I'm so grateful and honored to be able to serve in that capacity, being that we have held the line on so many bad national policies while Trump was in office and um, have continued to progress in the ways that I think New Mexico um, is on the right track right now. Okay. So um, you've been in two sessions, two full sessions now, our four full sessions now, um, two, two full terms. Uh, what would you identify as your greatest accomplishment as a legislator? Well, in the timeliness of, of this recording, you know, we have cannabis legalization as far as the recreational market opening up April 1st. So we will have had a week, I think, to, to flesh out how it's gone. And I think that's huge for New Mexico as far as looking at how we diversify our economy, how we continue to progress forward with our values. You know, we uh, had a huge criminal justice component to that law that automatically expunged records for those that were criminalized by cannabis. And so that was huge. Um, we've continued to make progress with the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives uh, Task Force that was um, that I for fortunately was able to be part of its inception story in 2019. And now we're seeing the policies come to fruition. The governor, the first bill signed from this past session was Missing in New Mexico Day, a statewide effort to help law enforcement and families cohere around finding missing persons. Um, as tragic as these stories are and have been, there's you know a glimmer of hope with what we're we've continued to build upon and and having a liaison in the AG's office. So our indigenous communities um, are well served by our um, law enforcement. So that's huge. I we're still on the path of furthering housing efforts in our state. We just passed a landmark $25 million a year annual fund for housing, affordable housing in our state, um, which has never been done before. We've never invested that. We get a 29 to one return on investment. It's the first time we're actually seeing that come to fruition. Um, but generally- was that, you know, your, that was your bill, wasn't it, Andre? I, I advocated for it. So we had two separate housing bills. That one started in the Senate. That was Senator Nancy Rodriguez. Um, and we supported it 
um, in our house and was proud to stand up and support. I um, mean, I've been working with the Mortgage Finance Authority, which is our version of, of how we support, um, you know, a, it's a quasi governmental organization that does affordable housing in our state and I serve on that committee. Um, so we've been just building upon all of these different things, but I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have one hat that I wear in the legislature. We've been working toward women's rights, reproductive health rights, education, better pay for everyone, better tax structuring. Um, and of course I serve as our house parliamentarian now in the chair of rules and order of business, which I truly believe in legislative power and expanding it power to the people. And we'll continue to fight for that in our legislature. Okay. So you must have had some disappointments. What would be your biggest disappointments as a legislator? Well, I think it's the work still ongoing. Um, you know, this unfortunately not everything happens in one fell swoop. Uh, housing right. legislation being part of that and modern, modernizing our landlord tenant law. Um, you know, we're we're starting to see the waves of eviction happen happen right now without a moratorium in place post COVID. Um, and despite the fact that we have $200 million available for, for renters across the state, as that continues to decline and as folks, you know, continue to seek for housing while rates are going up, um, I am greatly worried about our state's renters and of course living in Santa Fe, the price of everything feels too darn high and, um, you know, for renters especially, I think we're, we're, we just need to work together with landlords and how we improve that. Um, voting rights legislation, as I don't know if you've been watching recent front lines uh, on PBS and, and otherwise, I'm, I think our we can do more to strengthen our elections. And I was too sad to see the uh, Senate filibuster, what we had passed um, available to, to us and, and continuing to ensure that everyone has the right to vote. That, I hope um, you didn't wind up listening to that. <laughs> I did take a walk over to the Senate just to to see it to to try to look you know Senator Schur in the eye and say how could you do this? Um, it was it was just so sad to see and but you know it's part of the process and we'll keep fighting for what we believe in, you know and and following that I would just say on water how we uh, regulate water in our state how we manage water in the state is something I am extremely passionate about. Um, and I'm working with many advocates now to, to try to strengthen uh, what we do in a time of drought, which now seems uh, continual. And uh, you know we, we don't manage water well um, at all when it comes to drought uh, as a state. So looking to modernize our laws in that regard as well. Okay, great. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, what frustrates you most about the New Mexico state legislative process, not just necessarily what happened the last session, but the way the thing plays out? Yeah. Systemically, you talk about this all the time, and we, we do, and we hear from everyone, <laughs> I think, in our districts that uh, I was always shocked to either learn or to know that we're unpaid part-time legislators. Um, the fact that we can't be full time dedicated to the needs of New Mexicans and working on policy with a with a staff uh, that is fully dedicated to our legislative priorities um, to me is it just continues to show why we might be slow to be able to do these things um, and why it is also it shouldn't be remarkable that we get so many things done in a legislative session. Um, but we have, you know, because we have that sort of weakness and in, in our 60 day session versus our 30 day session as well, where in the 30 day, right, the governor designates what what policy initiatives we get we get to hear. Um, and so it just limits us legislatively to be able to do what I think the people need us to do um, with those constraints. And so I really hope we can, you know, change that. And I know that we have studies ongoing that help us understand and determine the right way to go about it. I'm, I'm into that. I really hope we can, we can fix that um, soon, very soon. Yeah, I hope we can do that as well. I think we need to pay staff and, and legislators. And then we need to make some changes to the legislative process too. I mean, I just think that the public comment set piece of legislative process is almost a joke. I mean, you get a minute to express a view you get a boom, 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 one right after the other. And then, you know, if, it, if you're opposing a bill, then the sponsors have as long as they want to lay out why everything that the 
constituents said is not accurate. And it's just, it's not a level playing field at all. I um, agree. And when more people attend, you know, city council meetings than state legislative hearings, you know something's up with that um, when we the decisions that we're making impact everyone's life around the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so from the pers from your perspective, what kinds of changes need to be made to the legislative process beyond, you know, paying salaries? It'd be nice if the legislators actually looked like New Mexico instead of retired folks. And yeah, lawyers. it is. It is challenging, you know, as a working person and professional, it, you juggle um, how to get bills paid, how to be able to attend everything, um, being that it is a volunteer, um, you know, service. And so when it comes to just our the way our sessions are dispersed, you know, any job that you have, you also have to take 30 days or 60 days off in order to be able mm -hmm. to, to serve in the legislature. So having more interspersed step sessions across the year while we're unpaid would be great. But also, I think even if we were paid and there were um, staff available to be reflective of real time what's going on in the state, we make all of our decisions at the beginning of the year and then COVID happens and then, you know, something else may may uh, come about and we need to be able to actively uh, go into session to do that. And right now, only the governor can call those sessions and so it all sort of works together for us to be able to keep new mexico going and right now just systemically it doesn't it doesn't really reflect i think what we need to get done yeah i couldn't agree with you more i need to take a little break here to remind our listeners that you're listening to ksfr santa fe's public radio station and it's at times like these when so that when the social media and the mainstream media are so dominated by misinformation and alternate facts and just just out and out lies that a, a radio station that offers truly high quality reporting with excellent news broadcasts, local state coverage, programs like Democracy Now every night every night. Um, these are this is a great resource to our community. Um, including their coverage of cultural events, arts, and so forth. And so um, if you have a, a, a spare 10 or $20 after you finish listening to the program, go to ksfr.org, click on the donate button and make your donation. Think of it as your ticket for admission to some great programming. So thank you for that. Let's get back to our discussion with uh, Andrea Romero. Uh, the governor certainly made a statement in vetoing the junior bill allocations. We're having this interview just a few days before the, the, the special session, so Andrea is not going to be able to tell us how it plays out. But do you think that she had other uh, better options for uh, uh, making a statement about junior funding other than the way she handled it? Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, was thinking forward about where we are, you know, when we as a legislature with even the limited power that we had um, heard about the veto and I know our house chamber was immediately, um, you know, our caucus was immediately going, wait a second, this, it may be, you know, it's $50 million, which means a ton to our state, especially as we continue to look at micro projects across the state that this funds. Um, as far as making a statement, the legislature immediately responded by saying, that's just not okay. Uh, <laughs> we, need, we need this. Uh, we need this for our communities and we need to make sure that we've protected, you know, the power of the purse in this regard. And, and we really want to go back to the drawing board and, and perhaps overturn this veto. And I think the part that the point that was made too is that we can negotiate um, that we were able to speak to the governor's office. We have the special session to resolve this. And hopefully by you know uh, the time this is broadcast, we will have been done with the special and the junior bill will be back in effect. Um, but as far as just being able to you know, see what feathers were ruffled, you know, by now they'll be properly fluffed and back into <laughs> get back into action. Um, as the legislature intended, and, and hopefully that the governor supports, plus the opportunity to revisit, you know, um, what I think families are really dealing with right now, which is a lot of rising prices and, um, and inflation. 
um, and to be able to give some money back to those while we're in a, in a, in a boom year, it appears 40%, um, you know, our, our reserves are up 40% um, at the start of the year. So from even 2021, so it's, it, it gives us an opportunity to put that money back into New Mexicans pockets. So I'm glad that we get to do both and uh, for this special. Okay. Uh, I am too. I'll be looking forward to watching. Um, going forward, you, would you like to maintain the junior bill option? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it's like capital outlay. It's for those that are not intricately involved in the budget making process, whether you sit on appropriations or not, it gives the entire legislative body participation in what's going on in their communities to actually advocate for funding um, in those micro projects that are going on in their community. Uh, for me, and what was what I was able to do, for instance, um, there was no funding for the uh, Water Data Act, which is current law. Um, and so without the junior budget, there was no infill for funding to be able to keep that going. Uh, for instance, in 2019, when we had the junior budget, then that's what it was able to upstart the um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous uh, Women and Relatives Task Force. Without that funding, we would have never been able to start that. And so these sort of micro funds, we're not talking about millions of dollars, we're talking about thousands that, we, that our budget comes about when we do have a surplus and we're able to direct it directly toward communal needs. Um, and then anywhere else in the budget, you know, it goes directly to these various departments and it's really still very much designed by the governor and of course negotiated with um, the heads of our, our finance committees in both the House and the, and the Senate. I don't get to participate in all of that. So junior budget really gives us a hands-on approach to that. Um, I just wish it was in the vernacular of what we do currently it doesn't have to be transparent. And I'm telling your listeners, um, our constituents right now, how I'm spending that funding, but no legislator has to do that currently. We changed that with capital outlay. It has to be 100% transparent. You know, who's directing what funds and to whom. We need to do that with junior budget as well. I agree, I agree. Otherwise it's a little bit too much like a pork slush fund. And, yeah. and I, you know, when the junior bill, um, uh, was vetoed after I got up off the floor from being so shocked. Um, I went and I looked at every single allocation in the junior bill, and there wasn't a pork allocation in there. And I, I interviewed Roger Montoya the other day, and he had a great way of characterizing. He goes, the capital outlay money can build buildings, but the, the junior bill money can put people in those buildings to actually deliver the services that the people need. And so that's why he's a big supporter of the junior bill. And I yeah. thought that was a good characterization. Right, that's right. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. Um, you're being challenged in the primary. Who are your opponents and why should District 46 voters choose you as their representative? Yeah, so I have two opponents. Um, Commissioner Henry Royball, um, who's terming out at the county is running as a, I understand a conservative uh, Democrat. Um, he has a PAC that is supporting him um, that's, you know, uh, I guess funded by oil and gas and um, a lot of corporate interest. So I would hope that that's alarm bells going off to, to many um, of our community members, um, being that that's sort of the angle that he's coming with. Um, and I'm then sure a newcomer. I'm sure you're going to be disappointed, Andrea, to hear that we're going to be reporting on that PAC as soon as their campaign contributions become public next week. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, I don't take any oil and gas money um, on principle being that that funds the majority of our government when we're in a boom year. It just doesn't make sense to me. And of, and of course, it's not where our values are when it comes to what we're trying to do with clean energy in our state. Um, Another challenger is newcomer um, Ryan Salazar, who I unfortunately know little about. Um, I don't know uh, much about what his platform is or where he's coming from. So we're hoping to just continue to talk about what we're be we've been doing in the in this you know in this seat for the past um, now four years, and continue to run on a track record of progressive initiatives and advocacy that we have across the state 
from housing to workers environment to putting people first you know i think we've i have a track record now of how i've served and the votes and legislation i've been able to support and so on behalf of our district i would love the honor of continuing to fight and for what we believe in okay so what are, what are you've mentioned values as being part of your determination when you're um deciding what to support and oppose what are those values? What values are important to you in prioritizing legislation? So I have my own little ritual um, as I cast votes on the floor of the house. Um, and so it just kind of gets me a point of being able to center my thoughts and the whole idea of it taking a village that it's not just me casting votes uh, for myself, but on behalf of the oldest member of our society and the youngest members of our society. And for me, it's about thinking about that spectrum of how does this affect people at both ends of that spectrum? And then of course, everyone in between in that decision. And so that whole, it takes a village um, for me to even be able to serve. It also requires that the village is well served by that. And so as far as values go, is just looking at all of that in between. So we're running low on time now, Andrea. So I want to give you an opportunity to tell people how they can get in touch with your campaign and, and what kind of support you might need. Sure. Yeah, so I uh, um, we're looking for as much support as we can, knocking on doors, we're walking. Uh, when the weather has been nice, we've had this awesome weather so far. Um, so we are recruiting volunteers. AndreaRomero.com is the easiest way to get in touch with me. If you can make a contribution, five, ten, twenty-five dollars, everything helps right now. Uh, we just, you know, that gets helps us get the message out to voters and vote early when we get that opportunity. So that way we tick the box on you. Otherwise, we're going to come and knock on your door. Um, but everyone, you know, we're trying to fire up our, our bases and, and just get everyone involved. Um, but feel free to email me, Andrea at AndreaRomero.com. Um, and we can get everyone getting, you know, everyone suited up and ready to go. Okay, great. Well, thank you for taking the time. Andrea, and you know, we're going to pause for a minute after I close the show and we'll finish our conversation on YouTube. Um, I want to thank our listeners for being with us. Um, we'll be back next week at 8 30 a.m. with uh, Amber Wallen, the executive director of New Mexico Voices for Children. And I'm positive she'll be here because I recorded the show earlier today. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's really good. Um, so that, that, that'll be next week. And, it, and we're going to be talking about um, uh, not global, guaranteed basic income. Um, and that's a, there's a pilot project in New Mexico and I'm gonna be working with Patricia Roybal Caballero to uh, try and advance a, another pilot in New Mexico with the 2023 legislative session. So we'll be talking about that next week. So in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy and we'll be back next week. Thank you very much. Okay, by the miracle of YouTube, we're, we're back. And I'm gonna to have to take a quick look here. Oh, I see what we were talking about. We were talking about your principles. So now you get a chance to show us those principles and values with a few, with a pop quiz kind of thing. I've got eight or nine bills or issues listed here. I'm gonna give them to you and you can just say support, strongly support, oppose, or I really need more information. And none of these are bills yet, so that's obvious. So it's the concept that we're asking for a reaction to. And after we get done with it, we may turn around and, and have a deeper discussion about one or two of them. Anyway, the first one, public bank. I'm for, um, I would like it to be more innovative, I think, than it is currently in particular where banking is voided right now, where we talk about payday loans, we talk about cannabis and the challenges of banking. Um, I think if they focused on some of the low hanging fruit for where folks are needing banking, uh, it could be a bigger bank. Huh. All righty. And Health Security Act. 100% for, um, I think we can start with improving, hopefully, like our health exchange uh, right now for those that aren't uh, covered by Medicaid, Medicare. If we could focus on that for Health Security Act, I think that'd be a great way to pilot what we need to do in New Mexico. Okay, hydrogen hub. 
Uh, no, <laughs> not for, um, you know, this is not a renewable energy. Uh, this is not something that I think is to the level of what we're looking for in New Mexico. I think even fusion or <laughs> might be more interesting for us here, um, but putting forth our efforts not into what we know is proven in renewables and storage uh, to me just seems like way too long of a long shot that I don't, I'm not willing to cast a vote in favor for. Okay, great. Well, we agree about that one for sure. Um, public power, a study of public power. Yes, um, I sponsored this, but uh, after learning that on the contingency that we can work with our unions to build upon this idea, I understand they're worried about what our intentions are and how we move forward with this study. Um, so if we can work with them on a common goal, I'm 100% wanting to move in that direction. Okay, I think that is going to be the absolute requirement. I'm working with the steering committee, uh, trying to move that bill, get that ready for the next session. And that's one of the things we've just got to address because they really came out strongly opposed. And that's why it didn't even get, it didn't even budge. That's right. Um, so universal basic income study or or guaranteed basic income study. Absolutely. All this right. has been proven time and time again. And I think we're ready for a larger portion of the population to test its worth. Okay, yeah, it's being tested right now with, with 300 uh, people in, in uh, SOMOS's programs. And yep. I talked with Amber Wallen about it today. And I'm very excited about doing some work on that. That's Green great. Amendment. Yes, um, but I do think it also requires a bit more education. Um, to some of those concerned with the implication of the Civil Rights Act. And so it gets a bit wonky to the legal ramifications, but we don't want any unintended consequences. And I think it just requires a bit more information for those that are still skeptical. Okay, great. Tax credits for electric vehicles and rooftop solar. Yes, right. now and always, and we need to continue to expand this. And I also think we could be a bit more targeted to those who are in need that we might be able to actually look at how these subsidies affect, especially low and, and middle income uh, families, which are currently not, are, are on the fringes of who really gets these benefits currently. Right, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The electric vehicles are coming down in price now. And if uh, if the tax credits could be large enough, you know, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000, and then cap so that if you earn over $60,000 a year or whatever, something, you're not eligible, then you know, low-income people can actually compete with me for those cars, <laughs> and they that's should. It. That's that. That's the game. That's what I'm hoping that we can target for both rooftop and, like you said, uh, electric vehicles. Yeah. That, that, okay. Well, we're on the same page on that one too. No wonder I support you. Um, <laughs> how about full funding for the New Mexico Environment Department to allow for closer monitoring of gas and oil operations? Absolutely. Uh, the budget across all of our environmental organizations need to continue to increase. We did see a 16% increase um, for the Environment Department this past year, 12% um, increase for energy, minerals, natural, natural resources, and 13% for the Office of the State Engineer who oversees all of our water. Um, and But those need to continue to rise. We know that they're hiring. We know that there's still vacancies, but we know that they need to, we keep giving them more jobs to do and we expect that they do them. Right, so, right. We, yeah, we- unfunded, unfunded mandates, we call those. That's right. right. That's exactly yeah. right, which we don't like. We need to fund the mandates. Yes, I agree. So let's shift gears a bit and talk about the global effort or non-effort to address climate change. The IPCC just released yet another report, leaker than the last, and the last one was pretty bleak. Um, and it just seems like that all that the IPCC is able to do is generate reports that are ignored. Um, the window is rapidly closing on when the world can stave off the worst of consequences coming from climate change. New Mexico is sitting in a really difficult spot and Retake acknowledges this in some ways, um, I, I, I like to think of New Mexico as almost like a microcosm for the international situation where we have a really strong reliance on gas and oil revenue that pays for all the good things we like about our state. And yet that revenue is coming from drilling in the Permian Basin in Northwest New Mexico. 
And that reliance comes with a steep price tag in terms of the future. And it seems like any time we have discussions in the legislature about you know, anything we can do to accelerate our transition to renewables or limit our reliance on gas and oil, we get the same sky is falling kind of reaction from um, the usual suspects and the bills go nowhere. Um, do you actually see a path forward where we could reduce our reliance on gas and oil and start to wind down our drilling activities? And if so, where does that begin? So I'm focusing so many efforts on water. And for us, we can, I think, solve many problems if we were able to manage it the way that it is such a precious resource. We talk about el agua es la vida. We talk about the fact of you know, the drought constantly um, in so many different ways about how we grow as a state, about what we can do to even grow an industry like cannabis. So many folks are so worried about water, and yet we don't manage it um, in its scarcity. And I think when we talk about the industries that are taking um, and that are lacking, again, that oversight that um, that we were just talking about with our with our different agencies, we're not even meeting the current demands of the law when it comes to regulation and regulation surrounding water, which is again our most precious resource. But here's gas that you know, oil and gas that helps fund all of these programs that we want to um, continue to grow. And so, when it comes to how we manage water in the state, I think we if we targeted if we focused on that as our way of looking at how our lens of all of our different growth and how we hold industries accountable, in particular oil and gas, which right now, I don't know if you know that the way water is managed, depending on the way that it's flowing left or right, depend on, depending on if it's above ground, underground, different departments manage it. And so it makes it really easy for these uh, industries to kind of get away with this while the government is going, <laughs> We, which way was it flowing? Is Was it above ground, underground? Did it go from down to up, et cetera? And they can get away with a lot of that. And I think if we are really focused on water as both the thing that we need to be able to regulate best in the state is connected to, to the oil and gas community, it helps us create that venue and vehicle for better regulation overall. And helping us understand what growth mechanisms we have available to us if we were managing water as a very scarce resource to us. Okay, okay, good. Um, if you had a crystal ball, who would you see emerging as the next speaker of the house? Ah, <laughs> this is such a hard question. Um, I don't, also don't wanna throw any of my colleagues under the bus um, by putting them on the spot here. Um, you know, I haven't said anything publicly about this, nor to the folks that I would love to see as speaker uh, directly. So I feel like until I get their go ahead that they would even consider it. It's not me, I can tell you that much. Um, I am not considering, nor will I ever uh, put my name in, in that hat. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are a lot of amazing progressive people in our caucus um, who I would love to support. Um, but I don't want to put anyone on the spot right now. Okay. Oh, that's fair enough. Well, here's an easy one for you. If you could be the chair of any committee, what would it be and why? Uh, rules and order of business, and I am the chair. No, um, I, I have the fortunate uh, ability to be the chair right now of rules and order and business, and this keeps our legislature going um, in the sense that it's, it's very much how the legislatures run. We increased the amount of bills that we were able to hear this last session by making them germane through a process um, in that committee. Um, it, it dovetails with my work as parliamentarian, uh, which keeps us moving. And so when there's shenanigans from the right, uh, you know, or issues with the process moving forward, I get to be able to step in and make sure it keeps moving while we're so time limited. Um, other than that, you know, I'm I'm remiss to say that I would want to chair any other committee. Um, you know, I think when it comes to the powers that be, I really do trust our our um, our speaker right now, and and hope to have a speaker in place that understands how critical that leadership is moving forward. So, 
Um, I'll, I might have a different answer for you next uh, next year when things are possibly changing. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got to call the caucus together and, and see who wants the position, I guess. That's the first right. thing. Yeah. Um, so that's about all we have time for today, Andrea. I want to wish you the best of luck with your campaign. And how about if for the people on YouTube, if you give uh, information about how people can reach you one more time. Yeah, sure. AndreaRomero.com if you want to get in touch with what we're up to as a campaign and uh, make a contribution, you can do it there um, or sign up to help uh, knock doors with us. We're walking neighborhoods um, when the weather's nice. Uh, we're, we're getting out there. And of course, um, Andrea at AndreaRomero.com is the way to contact me via email. Um, you can, you can uh, text me, give me a call 505-490-6155. Um, and I will, would love to be in touch with you. We're fired up, ready to go. We've got tons uh, to do before June 7th and would love to have as many people participating as we can. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, we'll be posting information on our website about your campaign as soon as uh, we get around to it. It's gonna take a couple of weeks. Okay, okay. no problem. All okay. right. All right, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Paul. All right, take good care. We'll see you soon. Okay. and. To our listeners on YouTube, we'll be back next week. I mentioned that it will be a recording, uh, an interview with Amber Wallen from uh, New Mexico Voices for Children. And I'm positive it'll be the show because we recorded it today. And uh, don't ask me what's the week after that because I have no idea. Um, but stay healthy, stay safe, and stay active. It's the only way we fix this mess. We'll be back next week. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, Paul. See you soon. Bye-bye.